what is one of the outcomes of this great teacher called a global pandemic? And one of the great outcomes is this, what's happening right now, that we have made the time to come into a virtual little ticky-tacky set of squares and present ourselves to ourselves and to look each other actually in the eye. And as I'm scrolling around, I'm trying to look at everyone in the eye. Now, I know this is kind of a crazy thing because how can you tell if you're looking someone in the eye at all? Um, but I am. So I'm looking at everyone in the eye, even those who are just names. We're all just names, really. And saying, I love you. And uh, you're human beings. And each one of you has an amazing story in this life. And it was a story mostly about, I think, uh, interaction with other people. So you're here where you are because of the lifting and gifting of the interactions with people and what people have done for you as a little child and then more things that happened and mentors when you were a teenager in college and mentors in business and uh, when you had a family there was a huge number of, of people potentially around you it's all about community there isn't anything but community except that Something happened, especially in Western culture, starting in the 1950s, uh, which was unusual. And initially, it was something very exciting and delicious for people. My mother, actually, I can tell you her story. She was born in 1926 in real poverty in British Columbia and Vancouver Island. And the egg market had crashed in 1928, and it threw the family into poverty. My grandmother had lost a lot of family members in the Spanish flu in 1919 in Vancouver. Uh, so everyone was in kind of shock. So you had the 1920s that had World War I coming into it, and then you had this epidemic, and you have all these orphans, and all this kind of chaos in the world. And then you had the sort of roaring 20s when modernism sort of came in, and then the, the curtain fell again economically. And perhaps uh, that's what may be happening now, but in very different circumstances. But my mother went through the Depression, uh, World War II, and she met my father in, I think, 1953. And then she had the opportunity to move into a house where it was just her and Warren. And this was a brand new exciting thing that was happening in the late 40s into the 50s, which was single family homes. This had not existed before. This was a new thing. And for her, it was paradise. She was, she had her own kitchen, a bright room. It wasn't, the property wasn't shared with animals and farm workers and people coming through. It was like just her and Warren. And then they proceeded to build their family. She could go drive four blocks and go to Safeway a new, a clean place. You could buy groceries. This is totally new. 1959, 60, 61. And it became like a huge rush that people wanted to get out of these multi-family homes where they were stacked on top of each other and go into this dream of like their own yard, their own carport, their own etc. and their kids and the single family home, the so-called nuclear family, which was brand new brand new and it was an anomaly in human history this this never existed uh, in most and pretty much any culture you're in a village you may have a separate home but everything's kind of communal um, most cultures never had this so this was an invention of Western culture and then in some countries they built you know big concrete tower blocks where people were in these cubes uh, communist Eastern Europe where I lived uh, they were very ugly environments. They were extremely uh, sort, sort of inhumane, inhumane environments, environments in these tower, tower blocks. blocks. But, but you, you would, would drive, drive to West Germany, Germany and you would find the same tower blocks and the same kind of... But people were, tended to say hello to each other in the elevator and whatnot. But then gradually what seemed to happen was isolation set in. For whatever reason, the cost of living grew so that then both uh, mother and father, both parent often had to work uh, out of the home. 
Then uh, the divorce rate started spiking in the mid-70s, and that tore apart that structure of family, and you ended up with single parents in their cube, in their module, with the children some of the time. And then uh, jobs became more intense. Uh, instead of working fewer hours a week, we worked more. And then the service economy started dominating, especially this world, where the hours were incredible. And isolation kept growing and growing and growing. Then the internet came in, and suddenly there was uh, people with... I remember Howard Rheingold wrote this uh, book, and I think it was sort of the mid-90s, or even the late 80s, it was called the Virtual Community or the uh, Electronic Community, and it showed houses in San Francisco, cart cartoon drawings showing people in front of Macs with glowing uh, on, on their faces. And it was meant to represent things like the well and stuff was coming in that you could have a community via, and this is all just textual interfaces in the late 80s, but he wrote this virtual community thing. For us, that was very exciting. It was like, wow, these people are in these separate houses on Telegraph Hill or whatever they are, and they've got glowing screens, and they're kind of in a new form of community. And there was all this excitement around it. But at the same time, it sucked down so much time. You know, work emails. Uh, one thing so you know, uh, I worked with Xerox Palo Alto Research Center uh, in the mid-'80s, but then started collecting all the vintage computer hardware because Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC, invented the modern lifestyle that we're in now. The Alto computer on its Ethernet with its mouse, with Windows and icons, all on that Xerox Alto. And we're, we're in the final phases of restoring the Alto in the DigiBarn down the hill here. But one of my neighbors, Severo Ornstein, who actually created the ARPANET's router, he actually created the physical hardware layer to lay down the Internet in 1969, he worked at Park after that, and he had an Alto. And it, you could get a lot of work done. You could compose documents on this thing. You could do email. And this is like 1976 or 77. These are the first people in the world who had it, the Xerox Park people. And he said, can I take my Alto home and put it on a comm connection, which was an early form of modem, and dial in? And, and the whole discussion at Xerox at that point was, if you dial in after work hours at Xerox Park and you're working, do we have to pay you overtime? Because corporate roles say, if you're doing any kind of work after the work hours, we owe you overtime. And this is what the situation was in, in, in the late 70s, that people had their private time. So they had their private time and there was a boundary between, and especially in the corporate world, between your work and then after it they automatically had to pay you overtime they had to they had to account for that that it was eating into family time now what happened in the last 20 30 years is that distinction went away so that any job uh, not paying you overtime just basically said here here's your list of things to do and it's 24 7 it's 24 hour always on news almost so then all of that personal time got eaten away, and then isolation came in with the sheer amount of work. Do people get caught up in their emails after midnight? And this was become chronic by the late 90s. And so isolation was just everywhere. It was social isolation was just happening uh, to people worldwide, uh, incredibly. So here we come, and here comes an event that puts the brakes on that in that it forces us to isolate at home so now we're staring at each other whoever ended up at home you know and Valerie's with her parents up on uh, in a lake in Michigan I'm sure several of you are in circumstances you didn't kind of expect to be there and you're around people a lot you're looking them in the eye you're having to entertain each other maybe kids went home to parents or parents went home went to kids and all these agglomerations have happened. And it's a tremendous, like, pushing of the button of saying, this is the way you used to live. You used to be in close body contact with people, caring for other people, being worried but sharing the worry, and not necessarily, uh, you're socially isolating, but you're not. You're actually socially reconnecting. And then you have more time. Suddenly, like, 
you know, I've noticed like there's less email. I don't have any conference to go to. I have no talks to give. I have fewer papers to write. I can't go to the lab with Dave to do the chemistry for doing an origin of life. I can't travel and do field work. It's all gone. It's like a huge gift of time. Now there's of course a cost because incomes aren't there. You know, there's a potential catastrophe coming in the U.S. economy especially if we spike to 30% unemployment because the economy's in shock. So, but the positive side of it is Mother Nature, Gaia, or whatever it is, or natural selection has said, push the reset button on us. And if there's some kind of greater intelligence at, at, in effect, it's using this as a soft way to show us rather than a harsh way. Because the harsh way would be Ebola or the Spanish flu of 1918. If we had that running, it would be far more dangerous. We're being given something that's softer, that's, that's just trimming a, a, a little bit so far, that's actually manageable. You know, Ebola is not manageable. Um, the bubonic plague for the Europeans on the two big episodes was not manageable. It just ripped through the population. So we're not being given that kind of a harsh, uh, harsh treatment this time. So anyway, uh, the second part of my comments, and then we'll open it up, are what, in scenario planning, you know, you can do all these what-if scenarios. Uh, one of the things I always caution is don't really attach to any of them. Don't, don't think of them as, as any of them as uh, real. Uh, but consider if we are in a situation in five or six months where we start to come out of this, uh, and it's still raging, say, in the southeast. So it's going to be uneven. So just like South Korea may be coming out of this sooner, and then restricting travel from outside, because it doesn't want to get reinfected. So it's still isolating from other nations. But the United States is, is a much more amorphous mass than South Korea. It, it can't enforce the same discipline. So there's this crazy willy-nilly coming out of the restrictions because of economic pressure, political, and people just simply having to not socially isolate anymore. They just can't do it anymore. And then they start moving. They start moving across the country, air travel kicks up, and then it erupts again. And it, it's bad in certain areas, it erupts again, and it seems to, it just continues because there isn't a coordinated approach. I mean, that's what everyone has been worried about the United States because of the lack of discipline and coordination. Because we have 50 states and we have all these ideologies and it's a big, impossible to govern country, right, compared to other countries. And so you have this ongoing thing for years potentially. Now it depends on the profile of the virus, whether it, it dies down quickly within the population, depending on its dwell time. But if suddenly it's like 1932, 1932-33, after the, the crash of 1929, there was a Dust Bowl event uh, in the center part of the country and people lost their farms, they lost their food source, their livelihood. They loaded everything up into Model T's, jalopies, and they headed west for work. And it was called the Dust Bowl and it was a mass migration of hundreds of thousands at least of people, desperate, starving families, going to California for work. And Their Grapes of Wrath was a very well-known book and movie about this. And so this has happened in the country. So if you have mass migrations, how does that reshape the country? How does that reshape how people live? Do people want those groups to come into their area? And in the Grapes of Wrath, there was a lot of resistance of the so-called Okies that were coming in from Oklahoma. Uh, and, and they, they were, were treated, treated terribly. terribly. You know, and they, they worked, worked on, pick. they were pickers. I mean, they worked in the orchards and stuff. Uh, so there was this whole thing uh, going on. Uh, but if, if these migrations happen, if the economy does lose 30 to 40 percent of its jobs and its, its employment, and there's just businesses closed everywhere, there's okay. massive bankruptcies everywhere, uh, and it's sudden. I mean, that's the that's the the thing about this is so sudden. Uh, 
it's so sudden that financial institutions can't even respond uh, and that economists can't do any kind of predictions. I mean, even, even the 2000, 2008, 9 a housing crash or mortgage roll or whatever you might have called that, uh, there was some kind of sense to it that affected certain sectors uh, and certain things could be done to prevent the complete run on the banks, for example. Was well, this one's affecting everything simultaneously? And economists are, uh, some smart economists are saying, this is a wrecking of the economy. So on the one hand, it takes potentially the U.S. out of a hegemon position in the world, which it, it has been long overdue, because China's the hegemon in Asia now. We can't extend uh, military force power uh, as much as we can. We're not welcome. We can't borrow like we've been borrowing, and we've lost our goodwill a lot of the parts of the world. So the U.S., there's no reason for the U.S. to uh, remain the dominant superpower in this century. There's really no reason. Russia fell out of that position, and the U.S. will follow and fall out of that position. There will be a new hegemon, and it's probably China. Um, but the U.S. will have an oversized military. That's a bit of a diversion. That's sort of the geopolitics of things. But the humbling of, say, the hubris of the last 25 years of American uh, exceptionalism is potentially going to happen. And maybe that's a humbling of us as a people as well. But back to community. Uh, so what do you do if you are out of a job chronically? You know, Starbucks has closed 30% of its locations and they're not reopening because the demand is so down. It just crushed the corporation. So these are empty. Uh, what do you do? Uh, that was what your training was. Uh, what if you have skills? What if you're a carpenter and there's no buildings being built? What if you're uh, somebody who's a manicurist? Uh, what, what do you do? I think it's going to come down to uh, new forms of instantaneous community where, you know, uh, a carpenter moves in with a, a community that's forming and helps to build things. Or the barista learns a whole bunch of new skills and ends up uh, really serving a community from the from the culinary standpoint, learning all kinds of skills and says, I, I'm not earning a dime, but I'm fed. So some people are cash earners and some are not. And if you Google and look at intentional communities, especially the there's millennial intentional communities, a lot of them here in the Bay Area and elsewhere, they're fascinating to study. And uh, Iceman here uh, is very familiar with that coming from the Manzanita community in the Haight-Ashbury. And then there's farm-based, country-based ones where they have training programs or they raise a lot of, they make cheese or et cetera, et cetera, more traditional, almost 60s or original type communities. Um, but what about these meta communities that are, you know, uh, not necessarily in between that, in between sort of very high tech company founders in a nerd house and then the real hippie style, you know, from the old days. Uh, in, in some sense, the, the hippie style communities can only serve a tiny fraction of the population. You just can't, you can't scale that as well. But what's happening in Santa Cruz is there's all kinds of single family homes that I don't know what percentage it is. They're full of community. They're, they have 15 people, eight people because of the economics. So the single family home of the 50s, 60s and 70s is being converted as we speak into something new. Um, I'm just throwing all this stuff out there before I open the, the gates here. But it's a real opportunity to reset into, into community, okay? I, if I unmute everybody, you can all say hi. Then I'll mute. I'll mute everyone. Hello. And, uh, okay, I'm going to... Hi, Bruce. Uh, I'm, no. I'm unmuted, so you can all say hello to the community. Howdy. Howdy. I love that. Howdy. 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 Yeah. Hi, oh, it's wonderful. 
Hello. So was that was that interesting? All that speculating and pontificating. Mm -hmm. Totally. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of history, you know. Well said. To burst. Rich. Okay. A few things to add to add 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 Okay, so Rich is going to add some thoughts. So I'm going to mute everyone, and then Rich can unmute, and he can take over. Okay, now Rich, you'll have to unmute. So um, I'm. I want to. I want to add a couple of thoughts from my perspective. I do advisory work in, in commerce across the globe. I'm particularly involved in Australia's national response to COVID and, and in an initiative there aimed at ensuring that when we come out of it, we don't build the old again, mm -hmm. but build new. And there are a few words that I think are really critical. One is to build resilience into the new. The second thought that is central to what we are doing is born of a national analysis, particularly around infrastructure which basically concluded that the center has failed. Centers of large complex systems are not the place from which to um, exercise control, that it's at the community level that control has to exist. And so, for example, you don't solve decarbonizing a transportation system by redesigning transport in Australia. You fix it in Ballarat or in Bendigo or in Parramatta. Mm -hmm. and, and you get community, local community engagement and local community um, design input and a very interesting concept. I don't know whether you've met Luke Homan, but Luke Homan is working on uh, participatory budgeting. So to give you a quick explanation of how that works, it, he wants to have 100,000 people each give $1,000 to a school and then let the children decide how that thousand gets spent. Mm -hmm. um, and there are tools to facilitate community-based participatory budgeting. And so I do think that we will have these virtual communities, not necessarily requiring 15 people to be in a house in Santa Cruz, that we will have tools like we're using now, and we will have tools like Mind Mind have another, another collective, collective idea, idea gathering, gathering and filtering tools, and we will have community-based um, budgeting, and we will have central gathering of money to f make good investments in community designed. So Rich, how is this being accepted in Australia? How's that uh, going down? I mean, it's early days. It's very, very early days. I mean, it, it, it's really important to understand. I'm, I'm working directly with the sort of number two guy in the national COVID response team. Um, he is a, a god in commerce in Australia. They have basically broken their task lists into three buckets, one of which is, what do we have to do in the next two or three days that's an emergency solution? What do we have to do over the next several weeks so that we uh, come out of this and recover? And then what do we have to do to make sure we don't rebuild the old, which is longer term stuff. But that's things like we have to have more robust supply chains. We can't put ourselves in a situation where every mask in the world is manufactured in China mm -hmm. and we can't get any, right? Um, so th there's simultaneous effort going on all these fronts. And there's, a, I think, a, an emerging consciousness of the importance of well-being and, and care for the populace, the realization that we can screw things up so badly that, you know, we kill a lot of people. Back down to a community level of, say, your community, your, where you live. Has anyone invented something, come up with something in the groups that you're working with? I mean, we've, I've told you about what we're doing here on the farm, and we have a few more, you know, we're we're planting gardens and we're working on our health, et cetera, et cetera. But anybody in the group have some tips or tricks on on building your own local instant pop up community? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. 
Michael. Michael. Okay. Hi, Bruce. Thanks for gathering us. Um, well, I can't exactly answer the question on a pop-up community, but I, I really like the theme uh, that you were addressing of the houses, normal residential houses being converted into more of a communal environment. And uh, I remember many years ago visiting the Domenher community, right, in Italy, and they have about 800 members, and about 200 of them are housed in uh, their central uh, property, but then they have uh, purchased residential homes in the surrounding area and with their own teams retrofitted those homes so they had bigger kitchens, more bedrooms, so they could all house uh, roughly 20 people each. Mm -hmm. And just like is starting to occur here, different uh, of these nucleos, as they called them, nucleos, cool word, cool word I thought, uh, had businesses associated with them and so forth. But I think what can happen here and has, has happened in some cases uh, is that these uh, communal houses can uh, have a network their resources and use like the Dominher community, a community currency and uh, really further, uh, uh, you know, leverage their group buying for basic supplies and so forth and share services among them and so forth. So I'm just thinking that there, there's room for more innovation in what's starting to occur here with these communities. Um, so I just want to make that observation. Um, but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, Catherine, Catherine and, and I watched, watched a, do a, do a couple, couple of Dominar documentaries, documentaries last, last night. night. Very, very, very uh, inspiring. inspiring. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. 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 I, want, I want to mention that we are working in, Bruce, uh, you remember the genesis of Communitas Zone. Uh, we are now online, uh, still in beta with a private social network, basically four communities. And uh, it's, it's the URL is, I'll put it in the window, it's communitas.zone. And it kind of emerged out of the festival culture, Burning Man and the other conscious festivals and the wanting to form new ways to relate and connect after the festivals. And, and on the other hand, the intentional community movement, the global eco-village network and this kind of parallel culture that had been evolving the concept was to have more connection between them, but it also encompasses all the other communities of practice that populate those those cultures. So I wanted to mention that, and I hope when we're ready for prime time, which will be later in the summer, um, we're going to really expand the membership, and um, hopefully some of you might be interested. So Wonderful. wonderful. Yeah. Thanks, 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 thanks Gaz. We call him Gaz. TJ Gaz. <laughs> Thank you. Great to be here with you guys. Thanks, guys. It looks like we have a. Oh, Holly, oh, Holly you're, you're muted. muted. There we there go. go. From Jet Moore. That's you, yes. Michael. Okay, here we are. I'm Jaya. This is Michael. <laughs> okay, are we on? I guess we're right. on. Very Michael good. wants to speak. Yes, Michael wants to speak. And good to see you guys. Been a long time, and uh, Richard Arnold, uh, that was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. I, that's exactly where we're headed, and it seems clear to me that what we're going to be doing um, ultimately is having um, a whole series. Let's say a thousand resilient communities of, well, let's just say ten thousand people, you know, and it may be less or it may be more, whatever, around the world. But each one of those communities needs their own power supply, and they'll have enough people at that point to handle every part of uh, a society that's needed. I love the idea of, of a, uh, of a uh, individual uh, means of exchange, which you know, crypto allows us to use right now. But ultimately, we won't even need that. I like the idea of Michael Tellinger's Ubuntu, uh, one small town idea, where ultimately money becomes not really necessary because everything's handled because of your contribution to the community. Uh, but we can't get there without going through the, um, let's say, withdrawal from um, the uh, Babylonian money magic that now has us by the juggler. That all being said, um, what's happening with the coronavirus, I feel has a lot of unexpected positives. And one of those is, um, on some levels, uh, 
less, less consumerism, consumerism is happening. happening. Um, and of course, there's a whole lot less pollution happening. Uh, but if anyone ever saw the movie called The Green Beautiful, which came out a while back, it was in French, uh, it was a YouTube thing. Uh, basically, the way they handled it was they called it the, the Great Boycott, where everyone simply stopped buying everything that was offered by the big corporations, to which they had no response whatsoever, because they require our participation. And so, um, when, so I believe that we can do smaller versions of that. For instance, the less we use the banks, the less control they have over us. That is where the alternative currencies can come in. Uh, there's a very big difference between money and currency. I really like uh, understanding that difference. And, um, and there's no doubt that in this group, there is enough creative potential to make several beautiful communities. And uh, right here where we are within walking distance, I know that we could uh, easily come up with one of those. Uh, that includes Bruce. We're walking distance from Bruce um, and several others here, I think. So, yeah, I'm both surprised that this happened, uh, excited that this happened, uh, looking forward to the creativity that is going to be unleashed as a result of this. And uh, probably, no doubt, a lot of babies. That's Thank always fun. Thank, Thank you, Michael. You, Michael. Yeah, I wrote a little paper the other night that uh, the, our first gift we were given was Gaia, you know, and she's so big and so vast and beautiful. And uh, now we've been given another very precious gift. <laughs> and she's very small. And uh, it's she's come to give us an opportunity. But the, the oceans I hear are clearing up, the sky is clearing up, the uh, rivers are clearing. Um, I just feel like this is the opportunity, this is our last, uh, maybe not last. I didn't think we were gonna get this one. But you know, there's this opening and if we grab it, it would be amazing to what we could do. And Catherine, Catherine, you got your hand, hand up. up. Okay. I guess we can. I guess we can mute ourselves. Don't want to hog the uh, stage here, but I can hardly wait to hear from everyone. Please, everybody, give an idea. That's what this is all about. Did you raise, Did you raise your, hand, your hand, Captain? Captain? We have a. Oh. oh, oh. Uh, I have Hi. a. Shen Shen. Shen. Uh, you're Shen Shen. Okay, great. Hi, Jen Jen. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Hi, Shen Hi, Shen. Hi, Bruce. Um, so I mentioned this to you, Bruce, a little bit over Patreon, um, but I'm currently in the process of moving from San Francisco to an apartment on um, a biodynamic farm in the Santa Cruz Mountains. So it's not necessarily a community like within it. There are like 12 different rental units. I think a few of them are tiny houses. Um, I haven't spent that much time there, so I don't really know exactly what it's like, but I'm excited to experience more community in that, in that way and also learn a bit more about farming myself. Uh, because I think that to me, like I've always, I've had an interest in, in permaculture and ecology and sustainability um, and financial tech startup company in the cryptocurrency space. So it's, it's interesting where like understanding like assets and how everything is like digital and the, the money system and seeing how none of that matters in a world in which, you know, food is hard to come by or health, you don't have to worry about that. It's quite interesting to kind of experience that shift of what is true wealth? Is it, you know, having points in the system um, or in your bank account? Or is it, you know, having what you need to survive in terms of necessity relationships? So that's been very interesting for me to, to consider and 
you know, jump into um, as a result of this whole situation. Um, another thing that I was thinking about when Michael, you were talking about um, Bodhi was, I've, I thought it would be really cool to have like, like currency, currency within a community, like for example, on a farm or in a village, right? Like that used to be that way um, where different villages would literally mint their own coins and they'd only be like valid in that. I'm not, I'm not an expert, um, but I, you just see all those different kind of coins. And in a way we are kind of moving, or we could move back towards that, that model um, where say you have, you're living on a, a farm community or a larger community and you have a currency that just functions within that. So you make your contributions to that community, you get your credits essentially, and you can exchange them for um, food or, or goods or what have you. Like I haven't thought through all of the implications naturally, um, but it seems it's absolutely possible. Um, I'm and sure that, at some there, point the government, government will be, will be here. There's a number of examples of that. And one of the things I've, I studied that for a, a while, and, and it, it's interesting because those local currencies, and, and it works at Dominher. Dominher has its own local currencies that actually each coin is basically the value of a euro. And they use it in the actual Italian town that's in the valley that, that they are. And it kind, of, it kind of goes back and forth between Dominher. And they found it to be extremely useful. Um, from, from what I, my studies of Dom and her, I know Michael's been there, so. And what we, th what we have to do, of course, is be cautious because the, we are a global civilization and with globally massive infrastructure. And I think that the financial system, you know, people pillory banks and they worry about the hegemony of the dollar and this and that, but by God, uh, we need fiat currencies. We need we need trustable fiat currencies to do torts and to do trade deals and to move a lot of stuff around. It took us 500 years to make a trustable system. Uh, if you look back in the 1870s, the U.S. Uh, states were still printing their own money, some of them, and there were runs on the dollar about every three years, and it, it just crippled the U.S. economy. 18 right after the Civil War. And I think it was Dale Carnegie, somebody can correct me. He actually got everyone into, the, into a room on his estate and forced them to create a central bank to create sanity in an, in an insane, completely dynamic system so that we've had the benefit of this for the last century and a bit. Uh, of course, it can be abused, but we, my, my sense always in, in, in these sorts of things is we actually have to preserve the stuff that's working and the fiat currencies really do work. Um, they're abused by individual actors, but it, the fact that we can use a piece of plastic or a virtual thing to order stuff that flies through the air and we can travel, it all works so seamlessly. You know, um, a friend of mine was the one of the fellows who founded PayPal and wrote the code for PayPal. And the fact that it's merged with cyberspace and the internet so seamlessly and it, it, it's, it's the oil that greases the whole economic system. And it would be absolutely terrible if that system came down and didn't work anymore. So, so really the question, you know, I'm, I'm going off here, but it's almost as though, how, what tools can we use that involve everything from Amazon to Zoom, to working in a virtual economy, to doing local things, to make um, and this is what Rich brought up, resiliency. Um, how can we create resiliency in Boulder Creek or in Hubbard Lake, uh, Michigan, or in Montreal? Neighborhood resiliency, and I know there's a big movement around that, food resiliency, um, where we can use sort of local methods and currencies and trade work hours and things like this so that... Um, we, we have a uh, more robust civilization overall. Um, how, can we, how can we do that um, as a civilization? This is a huge, I mean, this is absolutely monstrously huge topic way beyond my training, but perhaps Shen Shen and everyone that this is the time where we're actually seriously going to have to do it. 
we're going to have to actually implement or accelerate current implementations, put them forward. Um, but what I'm what for me the most precious thing that's happening is the dropping of separation, despite social isolation. Um, we may have a chance to have a run at the intentional communities that our forebears did in the 60s and 70s and had some notable successes, but largely it failed. The movement failed uh, because there's very few of those left from that period. And partially, if you, you, you can actually sort of look and diagnose the reasons for the failure of those communities. And one of them, it could be that it was a guru-led community or was centrally uh, central power, charismatic leadership. Most of those didn't didn't carry on. Um, it could have been that people just got older and they had kids and the kids became teenagers and it just didn't work and it kind of blew apart. Or economics crept in. Uh, a friend of ours uh, was married to Wavy Gravy, uh, a place called the Black Oak Ranch up here in Laytonville, about a thousand acre property. is one of the first sort of communes, if you will, uh, that the Grateful Dead used a lot. She had to come in and save it. Um, and uh, Michael will remember this. She started hosting Earth Dance there uh, to save an old commune, an old collectively owned property, uh, to bring it into the 21st century. And she did that. Uh, so, in a sense, you know, how do we learn from those previous examples? And I would say that the number one thing that community falls on, the number one sword or problem that it falls on, is personal and relationships, interrelationships. And we have learned so much about people's internal process, their psychology, how they're threatened, uh, how they achieve well-being, all these practices that help people achieve equanimity and well-being, healing practices, medicine practices, uh, where people just don't trigger each other into some kind of, of response that, that renders a community in two and uh, creates anonymity or uh, animosity that just goes on. I mean, you saw this again and again in the consensual communities, intentional communities of 40, 50 years ago, would be personal disagreements. We probably have the tools to come to resolution that, that they didn't have back then. Um, they were younger. I mean, a lot of these communities were set up by people just barely out of high school or college uh, without elders. We have a spread of elders who are living in community, and Iceman knows uh, how we've been bringing some of those elders in from the 60s and 70s experiments. We, we can make multi-generational communities. We can work on the personal interdynamics in a different way than we've ever been able to work on them in the past so that the the po probability of success is much increased because it really does come down to if you feel uncomfortable somebody walks in the room it's not working it's not working in a family it's not working in an office it's not working in a community and those discomforts um we now have names for those you know the pain body and all, the, all these these things. And there's a number of people from my Luminous Awareness group uh, on this particular Zoom uh, Levity uh, Salon. And that's what we work on. We work on those pain bodies. We work on the internal, I call it the little inner kindergarten within each of us, so that we don't feel discomfort when someone walks in the room. We can actually work it out. Um, so that's just something to inject into how to make community work at the very deep interpersonal relationship level, perhaps. Anyone want to raise a hand? I'm unmuted. Hey. Oh, she, Catherine's unmuted. Okay. I'm up. I don't know if the candle makes it worse or better. I don't have much light up here in, in our little nest um, nook, so um, I guess you'll just have to hear me. When uh, Bruce talked about want, wanting to do a, a salon on community, you know, I was thinking more about intentional communities and um, during the course of this discussion, uh, a different type of community keeps coming up for me and give, giving me hope and that is 
I'm dancing, I'm a dancer and into yoga and all of a sudden I can dance with amazing ecstatic dance teachers and do free yoga with amazing yoga teachers from around the world pretty much two or three times a day and I'm connecting with new communities online in a different way. And an area that I'm particularly interested in is um, collective buying power. Um, you know, there's a, women make something like 88% of all buying decisions in this economy and we have so much collective power that we don't fully recognize in a consumer driven culture and uh, you know I've been thinking about the last couple of years how do we bring women together to start being um, more conscientious in their decisions uh, not just those of us who live in privileged communities like we do here in the Bay Area and we can afford all this great food and uh, I'm in the food business, so that's a particular area of interest. And women make over 90% of all buying decisions around food. And I, I'm glimpsing this future where maybe these new communities that we're creating during this time, that we, when we are able to socially engage again, that we'll keep some of these communities and start maybe forming collectives um, where we do sort of pool our our resources in terms of information, um, but then also financial about who are the companies that really behaved during this time. I mean, we know the we know the bad actors now, um, but you know who really who really shined, who really deserves our patronage, um, who survives, right? Um, and so I'm I'm just glimpsing it. I'm wondering if anybody else is thinking about this. I'm really interested in cryptocurrency, also. Um, but how we come together um, and pool our consumer resources is is sort of a just a slightly emerging idea that's coming forward. Um, I mean, we've been talking about it, you know forever, right? Um, but this is a this is a new twist on it. I'm wondering if anybody has any ideas or thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a, a, a bunch of hands up right now, so I'll go ahead and uh, choose the next one, Brett Ann. Hey there. Um, I, um, I just started working with the NorCal Resilience Network in San Francisco and the East Bay, and a lot of what's happening in conversation sounds really similar to conversations that they're having. Um, it's so strange that there's people from all over the place that are seeing me right now in my kitchen. <laughs> um, I've lived in cooperative housing for probably 10 or 15 years on and off, and I want to echo that in creating any community, it, it often people come into it talking about like how are we going to fund it, and there's all these ideas of what are the things that are going to be the most challenging, and it's always the interpersonal. So finding ways proactively as we're creating communities to make sure that we have an idea of how power dynamics will play out as people are feeling challenged internally or externally is really, really important. And then the other thing that I've seen, um, there was a Stanford researcher that came through the domes when I lived there at Davis. Um, she'd gone all up and down the um, West Coast looking at all of the co-ops that had been founded since the early 1960s and which ones had failed and which ones had succeeded. Mm -hmm. And the ones that had succeeded had everybody surrounded around a central mission statement. They had some sort of screening process and they all had some way of getting like new blood or interest. So the Grateful Dead one broke because they all aged up and their kids grew up in that situation, wanted nothing to do with it. And they didn't have a way to bring in new membership. So I just wanted to share those. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you, Brett Ann. And the next is uh, Click Michael. Okay. Hi again, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'd love to respond to both uh, Bruce and uh, Catherine. Uh, first of all, the idea of fiat currency being essential. I think possibly on the smaller community level, the currency could be worth what you say it is. That's the, what fiat all is, is all about. Uh, but I don't see why a silver 
or gold or other resource-based currency on the larger system wouldn't be like it was in the old days wouldn't be better because it 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 forces the larger group to be a little more honest with with how they use the money so that's all i'll say about that uh, in terms of group buying we're already doing that in fact you don't know this bruce but we're going to be delivering a dozen a uh, very organic from Happy Hens locally produced eggs to you on Thursday. Oh. Surprise. <laughs> uh, and that's going to be ongoing. So, and that's just one because there's so much resources as a group just in our extended area that uh, certainly as these gardens start to uh, bear fruit, we're going to be just a wash and extra, which then we can send out into the greater community. So in that way, you build a lot of goodwill, you build, build a lot of value, you build a lot of resource, and you build a lot of trust because in the end, communities live or die by how much people trust each other and how much people have each other's backs. And the trick is um, that is number one, and there are those that are better than others at uh, let's say conflict resolution because they conflicts happen, um, and uh, but the the trick is to to keep that sense of trust uppermost always, and because with that, then you're not spending half of your energy protecting yourself from unexpected daggers, and so that once you've got that energy freed up and you've got just the support of even a few other people, your creativity and your real gifts just start to blossom. And that's what we can do right now. And that's what this is giving us that opportunity. So I'm way looking forward to that. And uh, so, yeah, I'll stop so other people can talk, but uh, I'm so excited to have this community, uh, you know, to uh, play with. Thank you, Michael. A little interjection. We have Diego on here. We have Rebecca. Uh, and we have, of course, you guys. And Valerie and I decided to network a number of properties in the mountains here. And perhaps, Shinshin, we could even network the one you're going into, which is these are properties that each have different capabilities. Some could park a lot of cars. Some have hot tubs and pools. Some have multiple houses. Some have large gardens and skilled gardeners. Some have meeting halls. Uh, some have beautiful private zones for uh, sacramental work and so each of the properties and we, we call it the Santa Cruz Mountains Community Collective we've been having dinners we started last year and we go to each other's property and, and we have meals together and looking at hey you got a pressure washer you know we don't have to buy one and so across the communities there's this awareness and setting up uh, apps and things like that that could actually coordinate if we want to do a festival or invite a bunch of people down to do something very special. Um, but even as, as Michael is saying, the wonderfulness of eggs coming our way and they have fantastic mountaintop gardens there up where uh, Michael and Gile live. And uh, Diego has a wonderful place and Rebecca, they're bringing on an, uh, Christopher Hill's old property as Moksha Hills, this, this beautiful estate that's just down the road where Spirulina came from. And Michael worked with Christopher Hills when he first came to Boulder Creek. So there's this idea of collaboration across communal in you know, a complex and across properties and this flow that can start horizontally. So we're not necessarily, uh, to Michael's point, going to the grocery store and spending US dollars every time we're doing something. It's flowing in a meta network and labor, tools, uh, food, uh, time spent is flowing across the properties. And I think anybody who's been in farming, uh, in, in many cultures, that's what they do. I mean, they, when they're getting ready to harvest one farm, the, the harvester comes from one farm, the guy that keeps it running, you know, they've done this for, you know, thousands of years, the sharing of all of this. So that, anyway, that's just a, something's going on here in the Santa Cruz uh, Mountains. We have Charles. Charles. Hi, everybody. 
uh, there's a lot of really great, hey Aaron, uh, there's a lot of really great ideas that are being discussed here that I think are coming through the prism of a certain local uh, affinity group and certain local um, shared values. And I would caution that we're in a very kind of back to ma basics transitional moment um, within society. We're in a moment where people are about to be going through severe DTs from consumerism. And they, they will be vulnerable in a fashion that will allow their habits to be doubled down and reinforced upon or to have their minds open to, you know, another direction. So I would caution that there might be a need for a broader concept of community that accounts for interdependence and collaboration for people that are not of like mind or not interpersonally related that has to do with the, uh, the town model, you know, the, the you know, getting to know your neighbor's model uh, of community that breaks people out of this kind of um, established pattern of isolated distrust that came as a result of all of the technology that Bruce discussed in his preamble today. Uh, I think there's a lot of optimism for where we are right now. And I think a lot of that optimism is, um, is not unfounded. I think it's really good, but I would just caution uh, in our rhetoric um, doing the Atlas Shrugged model of community for ourselves, retreating out into the land for ourselves, um, ain't going to save this thing. Uh, what is going to save this thing is creating an approachable, open-handed, open-heart model of community that says, we don't need to get along, um, you know, in terms of what we listen to, what we believe in, what we buy. But we do have to get along as neighbors, and we have to respect each other's autonomy as neighbors. And those kinds of ideas um, are going to help us reconsider, to Catherine's point, our collective buying power. It's going to help us reconsider um, local governments uh, and what we expect local government to do. Uh, so I, I would just caution against getting too deep into the weeds of um, kind of the, the graduate level of uh, community building and really focus on how to reach out to that guy across the street that's driving a Chevy and has a football sticker on his van um, and get along with them and try to see eye to eye with each other uh, as we reshape society when we come out of COVID isolation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Charles. You, Charles. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Charles. Uh, next up, we have Gwen. Hi. Um, so it's, it's sort of feels like a non sequitur. It's going back to the sort of highly refined idea of community, but um, I, it's very much a both and. The the um, I don't know the person who just spoke saying, but anyway. Um, I just wanted to call attention to a, a, another level of relational practice and some expertise around relational practices that um, do create a sense of safety in in community. And there's a group called um, Relational Uprising. I, I'll put it in the chat um, that has developed uh, some of the more some really inspiring work around that. So just as a, another resource, just. Um, Cedar de Maris is an indigenous um, Ecuadorian who has a lot of uh, somatic mastery. Like he's a um, Feldenkrais practitioner, and he, from the somatic uh, somatic um, framework, um, coming to the U.S. was really sensitive to signals, the various cues that groups give each other to signal safety, and really refine and help to to um, identify some aspects of colonial, the colonialized mind and colonialized individualism that um, makes that under, that sabotages that. So he's like really kind of brought into relief how we can counter that individualism with practices around, and the really radical practices around dependency and intimacy and diversity. And one of the keys is how we can downregulate as a group. Most groups are really good at upregulating, and you know, activist communities are really good at getting riled up, and um, and that there's a the bonds really get created when people how to downregulate together. Um, so that's a really I just find his work really compelling. And so those of you who are really interested in the social dimension of what makes communities work, 
I think it's applicable to the neighborhood scale. Um, it's all applicable, like tr triggers and how we work with um, projected dynamics and our, uh, to the extent that we've worked on our own healing and um, shift of, of sense of self into a connected whole, you know, as awake awareness, the more we're capable of bridging across differences. But, um, but I really recommend uh, relationaluprising.org and their trainings. Uh, so I wanted to bring that in. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Gwen. Hi, Bruce. <laughs> All right, thanks, Gwen. And next up is Chloe. Chloe, you're on mute. Hi. Um, actually, Gwen answered my question. Um, I ran an intentional meditation community for seven years in Berkeley. And we were centered around Vipassana. And from the, the biggest, the hardest thing was the interpersonal dynamics. And I was wondering what resources and what we found was it was better to just select for people that naturally got along and you know we, we did a lot of different processes but I love that resource when I'm going to look into that and I'm curious if anyone else has resources and I also agree that I've been actually talking to my neighbors more lately and I do want to also think on the town level um, but I think these relational practices could be applicable to both the, the town level and the more intimate, you know, living in a house, living on land together level. So if folks have any other resources, if you want to post them in the chat or if you want to talk about them. And I just, it's just really great to be here with everyone. It um, feels good to be speaking about community and um, seeing folks and Bruce and Gwen and other folks. Thank you. Thanks, Chloe. And um, next up, we have Holly. Hi, everyone. I don't have a lot of experience with community living, and it's something I've been really curious about and something that I just kind of toy with in my mind is especially thinking about people who are not like-minded, because um, it seems like it would, might be a little bit more healthier if community like smaller uh communities were more resilient and not so dependent upon you know the the global um economy or even like the national economy like if there was some sort of resilience in there to maintain the overall larger infrastructure and so what i've been curious about um so say like a group of friends of mine, like there's a group of us and we all are very different, but there's some operate, like there's premises that we're all operating off of that are similar. And through those premises, we're able to navigate the interpersonal conflict. And so I'm curious as to what premises can be set up within communities where that, you know, it helps, it helps for those situations. And then also, is there a way to create a structure in a community that encompasses all developmental phases? Because, um, you know, you have the, I would say, like, people who are older, as, they, as they're older and they get more experience, they, there's things that they can see that perhaps someone who's younger cannot, cannot see and then account for their experience, the, the experience that they're currently going through. Um, I like, for example, if you have a community and say there's a child that's raised in it and say they get to a certain point we'll say like 18 or 19 and like the human spirit there's like an adventure in the human spirit and so perhaps staying within that small community they feel like it could be like the best thriving thing ever but they feel like they want to get out of it to see what else is out there and just creating structures and understandings for these certain things so that um as people are going through their developmental stages, they're, they're supported and the overall web throughout the community is sustained, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to, I don't know, just throwing that out there. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Darren. Thank you. Um, 
On the question of, am I coming through okay? Yeah. Um, community, and one of the things as, as, as we're becoming more of a secular society, I guess, so there's that lack of, of ceremony in the modern day, so to speak. Um, and so going back into like older indigenous cultures, there was always some sort of a rite of passage that people would have to go through to, to, you know, enter into adulthood or become part of the community. And something that kind of equalizes everybody. Um, I was also thinking in the terms of like the Shabi empire in, in Peru where their, their ceremonial drink was Wachuma, the cactus, um, kind of psychedelic. Uh, so there's a community that when you got to be a certain age, everyone went through a ceremony. And that was a, that was a civilization that, if I remember correctly, didn't have war within it or conflict of any major sorts, uh, sort for like 800 years until they were uh, invaded from the outside. So as a, as a, as a not so much a screening process, because you don't, I don't think you want to have a community where everybody thinks exactly the same, because then you're going to, you're going to become kind of inbred and you need a sort of diversity of thought to solve problems and have people that are equipped to handle different situations. But oh, if there's some sort of, sort of equalizing ceremonial process where everybody like gets a chance to view each other, you know, down to like the soul level. <laughs> this is a little bit woo, but you know, I, I feel like uh, removing that sense of other. You know, even if somebody's different in, in the way they approach a lot of things, they're, they're not that much different at the core. I, don't know, I just I think about the need for some sort of ceremony or initiation uh, or something of that nature. That's all I got. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. And next up is Michael. Hi guys, just a, a, a few uh, observations. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, talking about the nucleos and in the kind of co-housing context and what Holly was just saying about diversity. Well, that's one of the things I left out is that they had an average of 20, 25 people in one large house and they always made sure to have a mixture of a, an elder, some elders and some kids. So they had a whole range of generations in the house and they also would rotate, you wouldn't stay in one nucleo for longer than a couple of years in general. So, but I, it's interesting because a lot of the kind of communities that Bruce was referring to earlier, intentional communities, many of them like Dom and her um, and Oroville in India, they've had a kind of a spiritual uh, community basis. Um, and uh, I think that is our challenge to uh, create new models of uh, communities that have a much more diverse um, population and really populations what we talk about the co-housing and then there's an aspiration to do an eco village kind of level where you've got 50 or 100 people eco village but then there's the broader movement of eco cities and um, so um, the spirit of community is what communitas means. And I mentioned again earlier, communitas zone, this social network that's bringing a lot of these groups together. The word communitas means the spirit of community that emerges when a group goes through an experience of liminality together, extreme circumstances, something out of the box. Mm -hmm. So it just occurs to me, this whole the whole world is going through this kind of experience right transformational experience right now and we will all come out of it in our different cultures with a different respect for understanding of and curiosity about what is community what does it mean how do i want to be in community it's going to shift things it's, it's really remarkable to think about it but uh one final note i want to um mention arco santi you know paolo solari's project out in arizona <clears throat> which I, i've actually been associated with for many years it's an urban laboratory. It's more about sustainable community. Um, 
But Soleri's vision is that of eco-cities, of the major reconfiguration of our urban environments so that they are, you know, biomimetic, they're working, working with, with nature, nature following, following nature's, nature's principles. principles. But, but the, the small, small community out of Arkasani is very lively right now, and they've been doing a conference the last three years called the Convergence Festival in the fall. And assuming it goes on this year, I would invite uh, those of you who might be interested to go out. It's a wonderful place to experience in the high desert, 60 miles north of Phoenix. And it's a wonderful project, uh, long history, a lot of ideas. But then the, this new event is very cross-disciplinary and is a place to really kind of explore um, a laboratory of community. So I'll put that in the, uh, in the text window too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. And next up, we have Richard. Back, Back from, from Australia, Australia here. here. So, so a couple of thoughts, um, and I love what Michael just said. I, this issue of um, the sort of Ayn Randian, uh, we all go off on our own and build our Atlas Shrug community. It troubles me greatly uh, because we have to fix the whole world, which we will do by fixing communities, but uh, our neighbors are a part of our world and our neighbors community must also be helped to work and to trade with and so on, which has implications for currency and all kinds of things like that. But um, I'm struck by the fact that I work a lot inside organizations, which are themselves a form of community. And there has been a dramatic new sort of phenomenon that's emerged that I think is worth paying attention to. And the best form in which to view it is um, framework. So we deployed this methodology of how to organize a community for enterprise in a 100 person company in Chicago, now 150 person company. And it is the only commercial enterprise I've worked in in my entire 50 year career, where for we have had zero voluntary turnover for a year and a half. I have never heard a raised voice in that office in a year and a half. I've never seen somebody point a finger of blame in an ad hominem attack in a year and a half mm -hmm. because there is a value system, a cultural base, in addition to and in fact superior to the mission of the enterprise. So the, so the first agreement among the community is how we will be and, and adult authentic communication amongst us and a, and a respect for the individual that is at the core of that and a recognition that we, we have a mission to serve. Um, in our case, it's safety, efficiency, and reliability in transportation systems, but it doesn't matter what that mission is. The cultural values and the agreement on those cultural values comes first. And then the processes, the ceremonies the events that occur every 10 weeks and every two weeks and every one week and every morning uh, is all part of the scaled agile framework, which has at its core that everybody thinks at a system level and values people over processes. And it is now a way of being that has now been trained to probably a couple of million people around the world. There are there are groups using it that where there are 500 teams across 35 countries and there are groups as small as our little 135 people that all work together. And today we are doing all of that completely virtually from the home. My point being not that that is the way, but that community is not a unitary thing. Community is, you know, dust less bones feel in the sense that it, everything is a microcosm of something larger and it needs to have a, a common framework of how we will be that works for everyone. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Thank Reverend. Richard. And up next we have Angel. Hi. I have some I have I have questions that I'm grappling with that I just want to share. Um I think a common theme with community living is um, centered around simplification and stepping back and slowing down and simplifying life. And, um, and I feel that happening and that's, that's a desire, a growing desire among many people. And at the same time, I feel like we, I believe that over this next decade, we are going to be seeing the emergence of a whole other level of technology that is um, going to change how we communicate and relate and be in this world. And so I'm <clears throat> curious of whether you all see community living as a rejection of all of that and a, 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 a way to get away from where all of this is headed, or do you see them being able to coexist in some way and, and part of each other? Um, because I feel like, for me, it feels like there's two very divergent paths. And, and what does that mean? What is our world going to look like if we've got two very distinct paths emerging? And, um, and then kind of along that same lines is that, um, do you all see community living as really limited to, to people that have these really practical skills, like farming and building and permaculture and food, et cetera? Um, and people who don't have those skills are, are not welcome or accept, accessible or don't have access to those kinds of communities. Um, so those are my thoughts. There are more questions that I would love to have people talk about, but um, thank you. Thanks, Angel. I'd like to directly respond to your question about um, including or excluding people with skills. Um, because that's something that I've worked on developing these sort of skills my whole life. and. Um, I, you know, very specifically believe that I develop those skills to share them and to teach and to, you know, uh, empower others with that. I mean, there's there's no reason uh, to have them lest I I actually be able to share that and and be a part of that. But there's so many different types of communities now that I have developed, and there are plenty of people who live in urban environments uh, who have, you know. Community uh, experience on a, a more just relational level rather than a survival level. Uh, so that's important. And I also want to harken back just a little bit to some concepts that were mentioned earlier about successful communities um, starting from a central mission, core and cultural values. And that's been brought up more than once um, on many different levels as far as, you know, actual um, back to the earth, eco villages, all the way to um, your uh, standard corporation, uh, and then uh, screening, you know, and new blood and keeping it alive and well and adhered to a, um, a set of core values that everyone can align around. Because uh, when it comes down to like the strength of our communities, uh, it really is uh, essential to have um, everyone be able to look at each other and see more readily that which we have in common, which is vast, versus the, the smaller pieces that we diverge on. Um, and you know, and there have to be differences to get things done, and to you know have a healthy variety and be inclusive, and uh, and to learn to grow. Um, but there also have to be enough of the same uh, and, and that people can align around those core systems and uh, be able to, uh, to place people over processes. How's everyone doing? Uh, I know we're at 8.30, so we've been 90 minutes. And uh, there's so much uh, amazing sharing that has happened. I feel like resourced. I see a, a lot of uh, stuff in the chat. Scaled Agile Framework, I think that's from Rich. Uh, I just see a, just an amazing uh, wealth of, of knowledge and background. And maybe as each of us decides 
the kind of community that perhaps each of us decides we would like to grow old in community. I mean, that's was my motivation for buying this farm in 1998, was I wanted to grow old in community. I wasn't going to have have kids, so having a family sort of instant community. Um, but I thought that the land would be large enough and diverse enough to support a diverse uh, group, maybe of no more than six or seven or eight people, uh, and that within the context of this land would come uh, visitors, many, many guests. And this has happened for 22 years now. And we've held full on you know, weddings and little mini conferences and tours of the Digi Barn and ceremony and all of this. And it's been so rich. And this is our continued plan um, to actually hold retreats, to hold the kind of ceremonies that have been talked about to hold the kind of high-level business. You know, so, for instance, a place for people who are working on Rich's uh, methodology to come and talk about it over three or four days, uh, right next to Silicon Valley. Uh, just exploration of creativity, sexuality, uh, all of this sort of stuff, so that the community is richly connected with uh, a variety of groups, not just one, but this continuous flow-through of groups. And there is actually a uh, pent-up demand for places to do this kind of work in the Bay Area. Uh, there isn't, there aren't that many available. Uh, so that that's kind of what's happening here at Ancient Oaks and we, we call the community part wildflower. Um, but that's sort of where I sit and I'm, I'm so grateful for all of you because the technology and the sociology and the methodology of making a healthily bound, healthily bound together residential community that also has guests coming in, that also has uh, this flush of energy flowing through, and it also has external members, uh, which a couple of are on this call. I see Aaron here. I think of Charles as another external member. Uh, we're people who are real friends of the community who are super welcome at any time uh, to, to come in and, and spend time that they need when they need that. Um, so I sort of back to what I know, which is the dream that we're building here. Uh, we can't grow a whole lot of food. I mean, if we really worked on it, we might be able to grow and can and raise chickens and do a few of it, but it's just not enough acreage, it's not enough automation. I think it's kind of, uh, uh, it, it's hard to imagine the amount of labor needed to grow a significant of the, your calories in the food you eat is su substantial. The labor is substantial and the in, actually investment can be too. So we're not trying to go to that kind of sustainability, but in a sense, a place of rejuvenation so that everyone who comes here feels up, upscaled and rejuvenated as we do. Uh, and just being able to give that gift to uh, other communities. Um, and storytelling, old-fashioned storytelling around a, a fire, virtual or otherwise. Um, just a very pleasurable, high-quality life that one could grow old into. Uh, and then I, what I've done, and just so that for those of you who own properties, when I, when I bought this place in 1998, I put it into a trust. So it's not actually in my name because these trust structures allow land, you know, landowners, you paid off your mortgage and you can name successor trustees and beneficiaries. It's pretty common here in the U.S. So if you do that, when you, when you, when you buy your property and you're putting all that investment, that actually is a, a legal way to invite people in to become successor trustees and, and beneficiaries and members uh, that's pretty easy to do. Uh, it's a, right now it's a, it's a vehicle for uh, avoiding probate uh, and those kinds of things. But that carries for two generations. So each one of us who does acquire a property can do that. I mean, if we're not planning on selling it and taking the cash and going to some exotic location, if we want to gift all this effort on, all this beauty that we built into the land and the relationships 
we can do this. We can legally pass that on uh, so that it just is a continuing gift. Uh, local zoning laws, I think, are going to change because here in Santa Cruz, we have massive pressure of housing of people having to build accessory dwelling units. The city uh, is just chaotic. It's just difficult to work with planning departments and things like this. I think that's going to change because the situation is, is fast outrunning uh, local ordinances. Um, after the earthquake of 1989, Santa Cruz did relax the system because they realized it was an extraordinary event of people's damaged houses and things like this. Um, I'm just going on here for these are very local issues, but our city governments are going to have to get on board with city and county, uh, with uh, the community is becoming uh, the unit, not the single family dwelling, and the taxpayers are fluid. People who, who's paying the city taxes you know, when you have a house of 15 people in this continuous flow through? Is it the landowner? What if the community buys the house and who, what is going on? It, it's a huge rolling transformation. Um, so those are a few more of the pragmatic points uh, that are coming up for us as we look forward for 20 to 30 more years here. Um, and we hope that the world does stabilize and come back uh, to where there's so much less fear and there's freedom to move and freedom to hug, you know, freedom to be in close body proximity. We, of course, hope for that. Um, but, uh, man, I, I think that Diego, uh, one of our uh, local community members, Diego's business is to image rainforests from a satellite to determine the productivity of the forest uh, for carbon credits, for issuing carbon credits. And they have customers like Microsoft and, and Apple. The company's growing like crazy. And the interesting thing is that, you know, Diego's sort of in the front line of climate change, because even though the pandemic seems unrelated to climate change, it's all related to the stress we're putting the biosphere under. And so Diego, actually in his, in, if, if we continued in uh, less carbon emissions that we're doing and less pressure on forests because we're not consuming as many products, you know, his company could actually see the effects over one, two, three years, could see the effects of recovery of forests Forests that are not being slashed and burned, forests that are being seen as more valuable. And that could potentially accelerate his efforts to create a, a, a carbon sequestration economy. Uh, so just wanted to point out that the group that's on this call are just tremendous. Uh, the skill sets and uh, the, the last kind of point, uh, isn't it ironic that this kind of event occurred in 2020 just as the new nervous system of humanity was in place and actually mostly working cyberspace the internet the companies like zoom if it had if it had come to us in 2010 or 1995 we wouldn't have been able to coordinate like this we wouldn't have been able to reach 98 percent of the human family in less than a few days because everyone's carrying around these devices. Everyone got coordinated. They, despite fake news and despite conspiracy theories, we all, we all perked up and listened. We listened to people who are common sense and data-driven people, the, the scientists, the healthcare people, the infrastructure people started to be listened to because we knew this was serious deep down. We knew we had to pay attention. And we had this fantastic tool and a friend of mine who works at Netflix uh, said Europe about three weeks ago almost broke. I mean, Netflix was running around. They just like, the whole European internet is just about to come apart. And I, I talked to him about three, four weeks ago, and he said, we made it. We carried it. Uh, working with all the companies there, we were able to continue to serve the video, uh, do everything we need to do. So there's people working behind the scenes to keep this nervous system running and to keep it full of useful information. And if you look at the collaboration, there was a 16-year-old who put up the coronavirus um, site uh, that aggregated all the, the data so that we can one page, we could see the rates of infection by country and the deaths and, and uh, the rates of people getting well. 
was done by like a teenager, you know, just writing some scripts. And so in a sense, the entire coronavirus response has been a huge community effort of people who really care, people who are providing support, information, YouTube videos, sessions, dance sessions. Uh, it's, it's actually a phenomenal community of human response that is unprecedented on the surface of the earth, across cultures, across religious faiths, across everything, and a, a dropping down into the heart. At the same time, you know, perhaps watching the Apollo moon landing 50 years ago was an aha moment where everyone went, or maybe sporting events do that. But this one was personal, and this, this one's a remarkable thing, that human beings could come together largely, and largely without violence and social unrest and accusation, in a quiet way. We did this quietly, mostly, you know, and let's just hope that it continues on. I think it's a, it's a mark of maturity, of maturing of, of the, human, uh, and the human experiment and civilization. Maybe we do have a civilization. So um, I think um, that's kind of my end of the salon spiel, but perhaps uh, we can have some, some shout outs or some f finish out uh, comments if you have them. I'm just looking and seeing. And feel free if anyone is uh, needing to go and attend to other things. Uh, Holly could perhaps give us a few more hands and maybe about 20 minutes or so more of additional sharing. Um, and I want to just also say I, I would wish there would be a way to carry this forward somehow. I don't quite know how, uh, but maybe you have suggestions. Charles. Charles? Yeah, I think, um, I think the carry forward uh, to the statements that Bruce was just making um, has to do with what he was saying the core of the wildflower ancient oaks community is, is that people go there and they are rejuvenated by the gift of that intentional environment that is created and I certainly reap that benefit myself and I think that the carry forward uh, here is for each of us within the communities that we interact with you know on a daily basis is identify the core aspirational value that you want to carry from this bardo that we're in right now all of us into the new normal uh that is coming forward and i really liked um what richard had said about the the first agreement is how we will all be towards each other with the respect for the uh the individual, um, you know, adult relations between us and then the mission second. I think that's the key. How do we all want to be towards each other? How can we model that local aspect of behavior? And what is our individual gift to respond to what Darren was saying, too, about the festival culture and the initiation culture? What is our individual gift that we wish people to carry forward from their interaction with us as an individual? and from their interaction with the communities that we're in. Uh, that, I think, is the starting point of, of modeling and shaping uh, how we want to move out into the future. Thanks. Well, I wanted to address um, Charles' uh, comment about, you know, what are we to each other? And uh, I, I think that we all have to remember that we start as individuals and individuals have their journey, which is a soul journey unique between you and your divinity and your source. And from that platform as individuals, you then create your sphere of influence. And your sphere of influence is all of the energy that you are in charge of in the world and that you use to create your offering. And then from that source, which is a sphere around you, you then bring that to your relationships and relationships form all these layers of community of which um, in, uh, in the experiences that I've had, um, you go from the center out. And so your most intimate relationships are the ones that uh, 
you have the most responsibility to, and you uh, continue uh, going from your center to the people who you uh, rely on, you trust. You, you maybe start with your, your children, your spouse, your family. You go to the level of neighbors and people who are conscious community together who form agreements to care for each other that are coherent and conscious as opposed to assumed. Then you go out to the people who are familiar with each other, who kind of know each other. Uh, you might think of that as the town level or the neighborhood level. And those are people with whom you preserve the goodwill and you come up with individual projects where it's kind of stone soup. You, you bring what you have to offer that brings value to the whole. And the whole is made of the sum of the parts. And of course, hopefully it's greater than the sum of the parts. And so over time, it's an organic thing that starts from just this seed awareness that we all have, that we all are resonating with, which is why we're on this call, which is why we're here, which is why we know each other. And from that beginning of seed consciousness, we start nurturing the roots, which at first are, are delicate and, and infirm and need a lot of discovery and support and sunshine and water and knowledge and careful tenderness. And as the roots go deeper, they become stronger. So that's where we're at. We're, we're just beginning this process and it's perfect doing it on the super moon in spring when people are just getting their gardens in the ground. Our community is, is like that garden and we are like those seeds. So mm -hmm. let's all continue building together and give it the time to, to learn and, and come together through these conversations. So mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to offer. Thank you, Sasa. And uh, I am very happy to meet all of you and I'm sorry I haven't been attending these dinners, but I'm just delighted to know that this heart consciousness and this soul of individuals is, is gathering here in this sacred part of the world at this time of challenge and incredible opportunity and growth and transformation. Now if you go to the store for free, near the front of the store is like New Leaf, Wild Roots. The latest issue of Santa Cruz Style magazine just came out. It's got a house that especially looks a little like Bruce's on the cover, but it's not. And on the inside, it's a picture of Sun right there. <laughs> and Al. Yeah, and Al. And we're part of a, a big story on when less is enough, alternative energy uh, of people who live off the grid in the Santa Cruz Mountains. <laughs> so we, we have 10 acres. We're a neighbor of Bruce. We've been a pillar of the community since the 95 or so. And have helped uh, to throw events and gatherings at our beach house and other places for, for getting people to know each other and to realize what everyone's superpowers are and how we can help each other create a better reality together. And it's an amazing community we have in this area. And now we get to share even more online. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Bruce had been involved with avatars back in the, the first phase of the internet, uh, the 94, 95 of communicating with each other over the net. And because of bandwidth issues, it only went so far. And now it's like a second renaissance is beginning to happen. And, and this is an example of what's going to happen as we evolve with, with these online events. It's pretty, pretty cool. cool. So, so thanks, thanks for all for being here. It's really great to get to know you one at a time. We just had Bruce, by the way, on our radio show today uh, talking about, the, what, uh, about viruses and where they came from and their connection with the origin of life and and other such interesting details of uh, where we find ourselves these days. And one of the things from our radio show today that I think is good advice for all of us is always go towards where you and we are being celebrated, not tolerated. <laughs> and then that will bring out the love vibration that helps us solve the problems that are real in the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And levity zones. There's a few. We shot a few levity zones. Remember Bruce up at the hot tub at Future <laughs> Peak. And uh, hopefully we'll be doing some soon when this 
six foot distancing is over because I tell you, you have to be way closer than six foot in our hot tub. <laughs> we have a request for a link to your podcast as well in the chat. Yeah. Oh, okay. We'll put it in the notes. It's uh, drfutureshow.com and uh, we publish it every Wednesday after the live show every Tuesday. So drfutureshow.com. We're on KSCO, uh, covers the Monterey Bay, San Jose, and uh, the internet. So, But really, I feel our most important relationships are the people we know and love. And, mm -hmm. you know, that includes a number of the people who are on this call. And I assume in the future, a number more who will be meeting since we are all local and seeking together. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. trust the perfection and respond to fear with love. And we'll get through. So on that note, I think we've got one more hand rising. And, uh, give you a kiss, son. Um, Charles, I think you're going to take us out uh, okay. today. And, uh, um, and then I think, Holly, if you can figure out how to save the uh, file. Uh, yeah, it should auto-save in the cloud. In the cloud, it'll email us, right? And we'll put this up in the Lovely Zone podcast uh, once it's edited down. And Alan did a wonderful job of the last one that's going to go out in the next week. Um, but anyway, Charles, you. And if you don't mind, after Charles, I'd like to share one thing I wrote today. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Inspired by your post and invitation to join. Um, and uh, so I wanted to put that out as well. And we'll, we'll start with Charles. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, very, very briefly, and, and son, that was a marvelous uh, set of observations. I think since we're mostly connected through the uh, through Bruce's Patreon channel, perhaps the next step for all of us is to post on the thread that results from the posting of this chat a specific paragraph or two about how we are manifesting community in the ways that we discussed uh, in this conversation. Uh, to connect us further uh, through the through this channel in between salons, which hopefully become more frequent because they're great, uh, but also to expose each other with specificity to the work that we're doing out in the world and provide multiple perspectives. Uh, shouldn't take much, just a paragraph and a couple of links or just a couple of words about what, uh, you know, your response were about how you're going to take Sun's advice and carry uh, th this, uh, this forward uh, in each uh, interconnected sphere of influence that you have. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so, thanks, Charles. Um, okay. So uh, when I received your invitation to join uh, today, Bruce, uh, I was very much inspired. And uh, thinking about core values, um, I started um, writing down sort of an envisioning of what the, my world would look like um, within uh, this uh, you know, community that, um, that we're building or that may be built. I envision a world where we are led by compassion and strength, where we have awoken to the truth that the two are synonymous, where people are empowered to contribute daily in meaningful ways without worry about their basic needs being met, where we've stopped paying, playing, zero sum game because it's just not necessary and it's cruel where people have learned to see the multitudes we share in common more, more readily than our minor differences where emotional intelligence support and resilience is taught to all and embedded in the culture where we take time to slow down and consider what is best in the long term for our children's children children and for all living beings, including the earth. Where we prioritize overall quality of life above the abstracts of currency, and we understand the metrics used to measure and create that quality. Where it's obvious amassing power and accumulating money do not lead to greater happiness and fulfillment, but rather the opposite, and that the desire to do so is a mental illness born out of individual and collective trauma where we have the tools to heal our collective wounds and individual wounds. And we are actively lifting each other out of such a lonely, clouded existence into compassion, connection, and clarity. I envision a world 
where we are led by compassion and strength, where we are awoken to the truth that the two, compassion and strength, are synonymous. That world is more than possible. It is here within us, boundless, free, and available. I feel it. I can taste it. I see it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Molly. Molly. We want to uh, unmute uh, all of the all of us so we can do a group uh, a group thing. We're all unmuted. I love you, Bruce. I love you, Bruce. Thank you. Love you, Bruce. Love you. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> hey, Chef oh, Hey, Michael. Hi, Hi. See everybody. Oh, we'll do this again, folks, in a couple of weeks. We'll pick a topic. You can suggest one to me anytime. Thank you, The little one down here. Nugget, Nugget never made an appearance, but that's the <laughs> You're all going to meet this one soon. So. I hope so. We're doing it. <laughs> so, so Nugget gotten bigger? Nugget is, yeah, about three times bigger and Three times more trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he doesn't he attacks legs and things. So he, he we're doing the discipline thing. I think I know why why Mike used to take him by the scruff of the neck and just toss him out. Now, now I completely know why. <laughs> right. <laughs> it is an adorable cap. Yeah, he's so cute. And, uh, we'll bring him on next time. We'll bring him on next time. Maybe the next salon will just be about Nugget and Nugget's issues. <laughs> right, it's quite a story how he came about, that's for sure. Yes, indeed, Aaron. <laughs> just in time. Mm, thank you all, and uh, Holly will reconvene. I think that uh, Zoom will send us a link to download this thing. Yeah, it should. Yeah, if you need any more assistance, just let me know. I will. Well, thank, thank you. you. And how do we save it? And save the chat. I guess we have to save the chat. You gotta save the chat. Save the chat. Chat has been saved. I don't know where, but. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Okay. Okay. And I'm gonna.